let's talk about the word quantum. If you've seen any superhero movies lately, you may have noticed them slapping quantum in front of any old word to make it sound sciency. Quantum phaser. Quantum spectrometer. Quantum anomaly. Quantum research. Quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement between the quantum states of quantum technology. It's obviously just techno babble. It's supposed to tell you, hey, this character is smart and this science is so high level, it's basically magic. But if you talk to the team at UBC's Quantum Matter Institute, it might just seem like they're doing the same thing. Quantum property. Quantum particles. Quantum technologies. Quantum uncertainty. Quantum tunneling. Quantum level. Quantum materials, quantum computer, or making a quantum sensor. Honestly, you'd probably have the same reaction as Paul Rudd. Do you guys just put the word quantum in front of everything? But in real life, there's actually a good reason for it. Be it quantum matter or quantum computing, quantum tells you the laws of physics you know don't apply here. It might sound a little bit like science fiction, but quantum physics is very real. Here, teams research how quantum physics shapes our world, and how, one day soon, it could revolutionize it. But first, what does quantum mean, anyway? Important? Yes. Straightforward? Not so much. Can you just define the word quantum for me? Uh, I can try. Everything is quantum. There's two kinds of quantum. Ask a dozen scientists to define quantum, you'll get a dozen answers. And that's because it's a sprawling field. The title quantum physicist tells you about as much as the term biologist does. But underpinning all of it is a shared theory, quantum mechanics. When we think of physics, classical mechanics is what most people are familiar with, even just intuitively. Throw a ball up, law of gravity says it comes down. Push a heavier object, laws of motion say you have to push harder. Put an ice cube in the sun, laws of thermodynamics say it melts. These are things that we can see and feel day to day, and understanding these things feels like common sense. But take anything around you, look closely enough, we're talking atomic and subatomic close, and you suddenly enter a world where none of the laws you knew apply anymore. Let's head into the world of quantum mechanics. Abandon common sense, ye who enter here. Our first stop, a crystal lab where researchers like Alana Hallis can grow anything from sapphires to superconductors. What exactly do you do in this lab? Right, so this is the centerpiece of our, our crystal growth lab. This is where we get to watch crystals grow in real time. So if you think about a crystal that you've had experience with in your real life, something like a diamond or a gemstone that came from the earth, those are crystals that usually grew over millennia. Here, we get to speed up that crystal growth process by factors of thousands. We're growing crystals in a time span of, of days. We get to actually see it happening uh, as the growth proceeds. This is uh, a crystal growth in process. We're growing uh, a cuprate superconductors. If you've ever had an MRI, you have superconductors to thank. Superconductors are special materials. They have quantum properties that you can see with your own eyes. Things that can't be explained by classical physics. They're able to repel magnetic fields and conduct electricity with zero resistance because the electrons start behaving in a completely new way. All known superconductors only work at very low temperatures or very high pressures. That's why one of the holy grails of material science is the elusive room temperature superconductor. If we find one, it promises limitless clean energy, portable MRIs, and as we'll see later in the tour, a computer revolution. Growing these crystals is the first step to making all that happen. Once a crystal comes out of the furnace, Hallis's team runs tests to make sure it's the material they were expecting. Once we're satisfied that the crystal is uh, good quality, we'll share it with our collaborators in this building. And when we all come together as a group, we can get a full picture of everything that's going on in this material and hopefully answer the basic question, which is always the question we're trying to answer, which is, why does this material do that? Watch your step. With the crystal complete and quality confirmed, it's time to journey to the testing floor. For that, we're meeting Sarah Burke in the quietest room I've ever stepped foot in. What are the properties you're investigating here? So with us scanning tunneling microscopy, uh, we really probe where are the electrons. That's our question, is where are the electrons at what energies? We're looking at what happens to the electrons when we cool them down very close to absolute mm -hmm. zero. And they do sometimes very interesting things at those low temperatures, like superconductivity. The microscope in this room works because of quantum tunneling. 
Electrons are quantum particles, which means they can behave like waves. That allows them to pass through barriers that, at least according to classical physics, should be impossible. If I throw a baseball at that wall, it's going to bounce off back at me. It's not going to go through the wall. But the electrons go through the wall. Still, getting it to work can be finicky. To do that, we have to get about an atom's width away from the sample with this very small metal tip and not touch. <laughs> and so that's the part uh, that uh, motivates having a facility like this. This room is specifically built to absorb external vibrations, from people walking upstairs to trucks driving by outside, even sounds as subtle as waves lapping at the shore a kilometer away. And so now you can hear just how terribly quiet it is. I don't think I like it. <laughs> but that's what our instrument's like. <laughs> I find it a little unnerving as well, but... Unsettling ambiance aside, the work being done here is essential to understanding the new crystals grown just upstairs, and the materials we use every day. So everything is quantum. <laughs> um, quantum mechanics underlies everything in our materials, and we just don't often interact with things in that way. And everything from a piece of copper to a chunk of salt, um, we need quantum mechanics to describe the bonding and their electronic properties. And so in some sense, everything is quantum. We've watched superconductors and other quantum materials being made and seen scientists unlocking their secrets. Now it's time for our last stop on this journey, Joe Selfie's lab, to see how they're put in action. One of the most exciting avenues, quantum computers. Walk into the room, you might think the computer is the big, impressive-looking machine. But in reality, that's just a glorified fridge. The real magic, or rather, science, is in the tiny chips hooked up inside. A calculation that would take five million years on a classical computer could take, you know, like a couple days on a quantum computer. Wow. So it's the difference between possible and not possible. Typical computers are built on bits. Each bit is binary. One or zero, on or off. But quantum computers are powerful because the bits aren't just zeros and ones. The bits are quantum. They're qubits. That means they can be zero, they can be one, or they can be both zero and one at the same time. How is that possible? It's quantum, baby. This is known as superposition, and it may be one of the best examples of quantum physics defying all intuition. It's like um, there's a chair in this room or a chair on the moon. The chair could either be in this room or on the moon, and I don't know until I look at the chair, and even the position of the chair doesn't exist until I look at it. Uh, confusing? Yes. Powerful? Absolutely. The power of quantum computing comes from the fact that with all the ability to use superposition, you can do a lot of calculations at the same time. Hopefully you understand the word quantum a little bit more now than you did before. Although in some ways, knowing more about quantum physics may actually make it seem more like science fiction. I'm looking at you, superposition. But even if you're still a little bit confused, make no mistake, the research being done here is important. Materials are so important to, to people that we have named eras of our history for them. The Bronze Age, the Iron Age. These are uh, ages that are named because the breakthrough that a material um, allowed um, enabled all sorts of new technologies. And we're hoping that the research that we're doing here is that first initial discovery that can enable some new age of uh, technology and, and better quality of life. It's work that can be hard to explain and hard to understand but it's research that could leapfrog science and humanity into the unknown.